So then, why do we pay interest to private shareholders just to keep a money supply, even when its value gets weaker every day? Every time the money changes hands, the images on it become woven into the ritual of transaction, reaffirmed so often, minute by minute, hour by hour, every day, again and again, until the symbols become a subconscious, then unconscious part of the energetic exchanges between all peoples who agree to use this medium in commerce. So why was it that in 1935, just after the gold was seized in America and its ownership prohibited, and just after Hitler took power in Germany, in the lead up to World War II and the Bretton Woods Conference that would follow, which would elevate the United States dollar to world reserve currency status. Why do you think the Eye of Providence with its message of Novus Ordo Seclorum, part of the U.S. Great Seal since the nation's founding, was suddenly added to the dollar bill at this particular time. in essence has ceded total control of the value of our money to a secretive uh, central bank. I don't hang around trying to read the entrails of what some statement in the administration may say because it's our responsibility to make up our mind about these things. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Picture a party of the nation's greatest bankers stealing out of New York on a private railroad car under cover of darkness, stealthily hiding hundreds of miles south. The key difference in, with the CBDC is that the central bank will have absolute control and also we will have the technology to enforce that. Secret meeting at the time, they told nobody about it. The details came out later. But this is the place where the most important people in the world first came up with the formal plan to create the Federal Reserve. This place is crazy. I have alleged that there is a money trust. Better for the state relative to cash. Part 8. On January 16, 1920, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, instituting the prohibition of alcohol in the United States, and rejoicing was not heard in the streets. But cartels and violent gangs sprung up and made fortunes on bootleg booze. And it really shouldn't surprise anyone to learn that these bootleggers soon laundered all their fortunes on Wall Street and in Swiss banks, where loans recycled and multiplied the illicit gains. The Grand Old Party. The Grand Old Party was a celebration held prior to Prohibition. But man, speakeasies, right? Those were so cool. 
That same year, on September 16th, 33 people were killed and over 200 injured when an explosion rocked the J.P. Morgan offices and a three-foot hole was left in the street in front of the U.S. sub-treasury. Newspapers at the time described scenes of turbulence and excitement which surpass any ever before experienced in New York. The stock exchange was closed down, and the governing committee decided that delivery of all securities would be suspended for four days. Some reports claimed police found sufficient evidence to conclude it was a bomb plot by anarchists, while others, like Chief Investigator Alan Meyer of the W.J. Burns National Detective Agency, declared that the wrecked J.P. Morgan offices were just the opening outrage of an impending nationwide reign of communist Bolshevist terror. However, a much smaller clip way further down near the bottom of the page discussed how Wall Street men accepted the accident theory, noting that it was both generally known J.P. Morgan was out of town at the time, and the offices of the Morgan firm members were on the Broad Street side of the building, while the explosion happened on the Wall Street side. Reported as completely discarded, however, was the theory that robbers were attempting to loot the vaults of the Morgan Bank and the U.S. sub-treasury under cover of the panic and excitement following the explosion. Despite the fact that $900 million in gold bullion and coin, reportedly the greatest amount of the metal in any place on Earth at the time, was sitting in the sub-treasury vaults awaiting transfer to the newly built Assay office, adjoining the sub-treasury and right across the street from J.P. Morgan Co. And they were actually transferring gold bars between the sub-treasury and the Assay office in a wooden chute. Like, this was what was going on at the time that this that this happened, which, you know, maybe they discredited it and said, you know, we'll just save that for like a Die Hard movie in the future or something. On May 11th, 1921, Germany accepted the terms of reparation while the bankers of the United Kingdom appealed for, quote, free trade. The Depression of 1920 to 1921, combining with the lovely public mood since Prohibition, lasted from January 1920 until July 1921, as the United States and the UK, along with other countries, experienced a deflationary recession, labor strife as unemployment swelled, and monetary policy once again shifted. On July 12, 1921, the Soviet government won successful judgment for Russian gold deposited in the Bank of England. But it was not until August 25, 1921, that America and Germany officially signed a peace treaty. And only on the 31st did Britain officially recognize the termination of the war. But after that, overall, the U.S. economy boomed during the 1920s, hence why they call the Roaring Twenties. Flowing cash from Great Gatsby types made champagne flow, and flappers danced like crazed floozies at 18 frames per second in fast motion. Europe was largely destroyed and depended on U.S. goods, and Americans produced practically half of the global output, while consumer goods began to invade homes everywhere. Factories, tooled to the teeth, poured out a torrent of products. but the workers' pay remained slim. Despite this, in 1923, as the Weimar German Republic stood on the brink of collapse, its notorious hyperinflation crisis was unleashed, triggered by the post-war government's missed reparations payment due in the previous year. And now you can play that famous wheelbarrow of money clip that is already buried somewhere in the recesses of your brain, because this is that thing. Meanwhile, U.S. President Warren G. Harding died unexpectedly in office on July 27, 1923, and several of his Ohio gang cronies were implicated in scandals while holding positions on the Federal Reserve Board, the Comptroller of the Currency, the Director of the Mint, etc., etc., and Vice President Calvin Coolidge took the presidential oath and declared the business of America is business. Stock market soared. In 1924, the Dawes Act was put forward to solve Germany's World War I reparations problem and thus alleviate a major international crisis. 
In a fantastic example of recycled dollars, Wall Street bankers organized under J.P. Morgan's direction agreed to loan hundreds of millions of dollars to Germany so it could repay its war debts. While the influx of American capital contributed significantly to the buildup of industry in Germany by buying supplies and components from U.S. and British sources. For instance, chemical manufacturing conglomerate IG Farben, notorious for, um, something or other, became the largest industrial company in Europe on the backs of Wall Street financiers. Not to be confused with the Dawes Act of 1887, which, in a bid to rid the nation of tribalism, quote-unquote, and assimilate Native Americans into new American culture, forced the Native Americans onto a government-imposed system assuming a capitalist proprietary relationship to property that did not formally exist in their culture, as previously they held a communal view of land that ensured each member of the tribe had a place to live. It didn't just give the government a way to legally appropriate vast tracts of Native American land, but it detribalized a sizable segment of the Indian population, legally preempting their sovereign right to define themselves. It's really hard to read about. 1926, the 150th year of America's independence. From east to west, girdling the continent, a lush and a lusty land. Yet even then, the signs were present. In 1927, the Showoff financial crisis resulted in mass bank failures across the empire of Japan. So yeah, them too. Because we can't be leaving them out. Everybody gets to have a crisis. Poverty, like a cancer. Malignant. And beyond the facade of the skyline, swept under the city's rug. Teeming millions, never more than a copper coin from starvation. Has the Federal Reserve the power to attract gold to this country? The Federal Reserve Board could attract gold to this country by making money rates higher. The monetary concerns of Europe can be altered. The Federal Reserve Board last summer, 1927, set out to ease the credit situation and to cheapen the cost of money in order to stimulate the exportation of gold. Where did the suggestion come from that caused this decision of the change of rates last summer? The three largest central banks in Europe sent representatives to this country. The governor of the Bank of England, Mr. Halmar Schott, and Professor Rist, deputy governor of the Bank of France. These gentlemen were in conference with officials of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and were the guests of the governors of the Federal Reserve Board the following day. Was that a formal meeting of the board? No. It was just an informal discussion of the matters they had been discussing in New York? I assume so. It was mainly a social occasion. The heads of these central banks spoke in generalities. What did they want? They were very candid in answers to questions. I wanted to have a talk with Mr. Norman, and we both stayed behind after luncheon and were joined by the other foreign representatives and the officials of the New York Reserve Bank. These gentlemen were all pretty concerned with the way the gold standard was working. They were therefore desirous of seeing an easy money market in New York and lower rates, which would deter gold from moving from Europe to this country. Precisely right. Too bad your yacht should have suffered. But at least it brought us together. That would be very much in the interest of the international money situation, which then existed. Was there some understanding arrived at between the representatives of these foreign banks and the Federal Reserve Board or the New York Federal Reserve Bank? Yes. It was not reported formally? No. Later, there came a meeting of the Open Market Policy Committee, the Investment Policy Committee of the Federal Reserve System, by which and to which certain recommendations were made. My recollection is that about $80 million worth of securities were purchased in August consistent with this plan. You have outlined here negotiations of very great importance. I should rather say conversations. Something of a very definite character took place. Yes. 
A change of policy on the part of our whole financial system, which has resulted in one of the most unusual situations that has ever confronted this country financially. It seems to me that a matter of that importance should have been made a matter of record in Washington. I agree with you. Would it not have been a good thing if there had been a direction requiring that those powers given to the Federal Reserve should be used for the continued stabilization of the purchasing power of the American dollar rather than be influenced by the interest of Europe? I take exception to the term influence. Besides, there is no such thing as stabilizing the American dollar without stabilizing every other gold currency. They are tied together by the gold standard. Other eminent men who come here are very adroit in knowing how to approach the folk who make up the personnel of the Federal Reserve Board. The visit of these foreign bankers resulted in money being cheaper in New York. Yes, exactly. I would like to put in the record all who attended that luncheon in Washington. In addition to the names I've given you, there was also present one of the younger men from the Bank of France, I think all the members of the Federal Reserve Board were there. Under Secretary of the Treasury Ogden Mills was there. And the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Schuderman. Also, two or three men from the State Department and Mr. Warren of the Foreign Department of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Oh yes, Governor Strong was present. This conference, of course, with all of these foreign bankers did not just happen. Would it not be fair to say that the fellows who wanted the gold were the ones who instigated the meeting? They came over here. The fact is, they came over here, they had a meeting, they banqueted, they talked, they got the Federal Reserve Board to lower the discount rate and make the purchases in open market, and they got the gold. Is it true that action stabilized the European currencies and upset ours? Yes, that was what it was intended to do. When people are remembered, there's no place like home. The 1929 Young Plan modified and bolstered the largely successful Dawes Plan with respect to German reparations payments and American investment. As the decade of the 20s neared its end, the great democracy of the West, the brave new world, became aware of strange twitchings and pains. Then came Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, the infamous stock market crash, which your brain already knows is really, really bad. But there were several bad stock market days in the weeks beforehand as well that usually don't get mentioned. Also hardly ever mentioned, even in the press at the time, was that the crash was being blamed on the mass dumping of securities by European investors, prompting journalist David Lawrence to ask who raided the American stock market, before pointing out, if there is a congressional investigation, it will be difficult to run down such theories because it would be necessary to have a record of what happened when the big break in the market came the week before. Lawrence went on to say the subject might become pertinent, however, if some of the operations of investment trusts are inquired into. What influences control modern money markets? Is there a concerted money power which can govern the speculative markets? What may be discovered is that what has hitherto been regarded as a local matter is an international problem. He also pointed out, for a long time, American authorities have been nervous about the great quantities of gold kept on deposit in the United States by foreign central banks. Countless investors were wiped out, billions were lost in a sudden uh-oh moment, and this quickly became the biggest financial crisis yet. But wait, wasn't the Federal Reserve Central Bank supposed to prevent these things from happening? So the Great Depression, here's how this went down. In October 1928, Fed Governor Roy A. Young responded to critics countering with an appeal to authority, emphasizing the idea that the Fed represented the composite opinion of more than 108 leading bankers and financial experts, and that their function was, after all, simply to, quote, maintain a sound credit and currency situation, end quote. And while keeping his promises elusive, noting that, quote, happy solutions are not guaranteed, 
end quote. Backing him up, his colleague William Martin of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis added, quote, bootlegged loans were not a Federal Reserve problem, end quote, so deal with it. Meanwhile, the same paper on the same day acknowledged that, quote, European business had been greatly helped by the hundreds of millions of dollars in gold sent out of the United States in the last 12 months, end quote. And thus, with the clock of hindsight ticking ever closer to the infamous and devastating Black Friday crash that plummeted the nation into years of economic suffering, the warnings began. On New Year's Day, 1929, came the Boston Globe's headline, Federal Reserve Control Endangered by Present Call Loans Market, wherein their expert statistician called attention to the alarming fact that no meaningful reserves were held in the system to account for the more than $2 billion of 1920s money that was circulating in unstable speculation on the stock market. Thus, the main object in the conception and birth of the Federal Reserve System its basis and justification as an institution was being negated and undermined as the financial sector assumed that things would work themselves out, etc., etc., all while unsecured loans were rapidly expanding, accumulating, growing, and festering without the proper required backing since 1925. Under these conditions, the analyst in the Boston Globe ominously warned, quote, it is hard to see how it would be possible to avoid a very unpleasant situation, a situation in which the Federal Reserve may not have control. Subsequently, as if in response to further criticism, the Fed Board then twice warned, first on February 7, 1929, then later in the summer, to put the brakes on growing and unrestrained credit for speculative loans as it was creating a, quote, widespread potential for disaster, end quote. The Fed, however, would not play arbiter, though board members admitted that, quote, conditions may be expected to have detrimental effects on business and impair its future, particularly as this landscape of impending doom coincided with the greatest outflow of gold in U.S. history. As the Fed put it, quote, coming at a time when the country has lost some $500 million of gold, end quote. How was it lost again? And as financial fate further pressed down upon the country, on April 21st, 1929, the Evening Star of Washington, D.C. reminded readers that this powerful agency, which defied politics and to which even monarchs yielded, held influence over the entire world, and that, quote, their decision may cause a crash of billions in the stock markets, end quote. How eerily prescient, even if intended, just for dramatic effect. In spite of this power, during May 1929, it was reportedly mere state-level banks that posed a threat, if not to the economy itself, at least to the Federal Reserve's hegemony, since these state banks were only a part of the Federal Reserve system if they voluntarily elected to do so. Therefore, they represented a minor, but terrifying, vehicle of competition to the Fed's enormous credit-creating power and control over the gold ratio. Thus, on May 23, 1929, while higher stocks and an enthusiastic record gait was being reported for U.S. industries, a desperate plea was simultaneously being made to unify the Federal Reserve banking system in an attempt to, quote, prevent the gradual disintegration of the national banking system on account of the greater attractiveness of banks organized under state laws, end quote. One effect of the crash hurtling towards this pre-Depression economy would, of course, be that state banks suffering the runs were forced into the system in order to reopen. But that comes a bit later. Meanwhile, in June 1929, in a case complaining about the ability of the New York Fed to, quote, arbitrarily and unreasonably alter the rediscount rate, thus affecting liquidity and, you know, potentially everyone's livelihoods on a whim, came a deafening judgment from the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, essentially upholding the unrestricted powers of the Federal Reserve Board, treating it as equivalent to a government agency. The judges emboldened the Fed's sense of entitlement, whether it took action or abstained from action, warned the public, or kept its information secret. 
It was absent any meaningful checks apart from <laughs> Congress's potential to change the banking laws. <laughs> so, yeah, get right on that. You know, call your congressman or whatever. While the Bank of England raised rates by a percentage point to discourage speculation in the spring of 29, the Federal Reserve didn't do so until August, just weeks before that ill-fated downturn. Quote, between February and August, the Federal Reserve was tending to tighten money rates by keeping the acceptance buying rate substantially above the rediscount rate. After taking no action to slow speculation, on August 9, 1929, the Fed unexpectedly raised the rediscount rate by a full percentage point which observers took as a sign that, quote, Federal Reserve officials are now agreed there is a credit emergency warranting drastic action. A short time later, on September 5th, 1929, business cycle theorist Roger Babson told a conference that, quote, sooner or later there is a crash coming and it may be a terrific one, end quote specifically predicting 60 to 80% declines, noting that the relatively strong position of the Federal Reserve System did not negate human nature or the economic cycle. During the next two months, what the papers termed ongoing dirty and destructive rumors flooded the streets concerning the markets and possible Fed actions as gains and losses reached uneasy and erratic points throughout September and October 1929, and a, quote, wild rush to exit stocks invariably took place. By October 25, 1929, the Federal Reserve Board was meeting to discuss measures to stabilize the stock market as a selling stampede followed a relatively minor crash that nonetheless unleashed panic. This included the New York Reserve Bank lowering the acceptance rate as well as plans for the Fed to purchase both acceptances and government securities to increase the supply of credit. That same day, consensus opinion held that the worst was over. In hindsight, more famous last words surrounded by bitter irony, along with this line quoted in full, when the Federal Reserve warned and took bearish action throughout 1928, it had no market influence as bankers gave support and leaders issued bullish statements, end quote. Yes, we know you just made that look, breaking the fourth wall. That is, the WTF, are you buying this wall? I mean, while the initial stages of the crash were underway, some columns were still publishing. As late as October 27, 1929, lines like, the market as a whole is in the healthiest position that it's been in for years, end quote and arguing that many stocks were bargains. All this, while the leading article that day highlighted the pivotal and ultimately detrimental role played by the Federal Reserve policy in the boom and bust of extreme credit stock cycles that is now a solid history horror classic. The day after the big crash, bad news was muted by the positive spin reports published on October 30th that a post-crash rally of buying by J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers, and other powerful financiers, quote, saved the day, end quote, as they rummaged and bought together major shares from the bargain bins of everyone else's failures, quote, bringing that market back. Um, thanks, pennies on the dollar crew. Amazing, amazing the propensity to turn a disaster on its head and thank the very... Never mind. Just never mind. November 12th, 1929 saw yet another wave of market crashes with steel, cotton, grain, and other industries plummeting. And historic headlines including, quote, billions lost in new stock market crash. Oh yes, a wonderful era. Haven't your grandparents told you about it? I venture to suggest that if you go to any bankers, the people who are here today at this banking conference, and if you talk to them, I venture to say nine out of ten of them, if, if, if they didn't, hadn't heard what I'm going to say, <laughs> that nine out of ten of them would say, well, of course, the Great Depression was a failure of private business. 
It was due to an overextension, overspeculation in the 1920s, or it was due to an excessive concentration of wealth in the hands of the wealthy at the expense of the poor in the 1920s, or it was due to speculative investment abroad, or whatnot. But it was a failure of private business, and government had to step in. The Great Depression was produced by a failure of government, by a failure of monetary policy. It was produced by a failure of the Federal Reserve System to act in accordance with the intentions of those who established it. It was produced by a failure of the Federal Reserve System despite the presence of knowledge on the part of many of the people in the system about the right course of action. According to a transcript on the official federalreserve.gov website, on November 8, 2002, then Federal Reserve Governor Ben Bernanke ended his speech at a conference to honor Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Freeman on his 90th birthday with this, quote, Let me end my talk by abusing slightly my status as an official representative of the Federal Reserve. I would like to say to Milton and Anna regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it. We're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. Supposits to cover reverses. Uh, um, sufficient deposits to cover reserves. We asked economist Lester Chandler for an explanation. Professor Chandler, the uh, Fed was set up after all to prevent bank failures and avoid depressions, and, and there they were in the 1930s with thousands of banks failing and, and a whale of a depression. What went wrong? Within the Federal Reserve System, Nobody knew who was to do what, at least as far as the Federal Reserve Act was concerned. They turned down the Aldrich plan for one central bank with branches and adopted a system of 12 independent banks. And then on top of that, they put a Federal Reserve board that was supposed to do something centrally. But uh, they couldn't decide who was to do what. Well, the I'll put it this way. We didn't have very many central bankers around in this country in 1914. As credit quickly contracted, money slowed its roll, and loans became scarce as the Great Depression, the worst systemic banking crisis of the 20th century, began to take hold. The unemployment automatic layoff thing happened like Brondo and Idiocracy, and people who started looking extremely pissed off all the time began eating from soup lines. On May 17, 1930, the Bank for International Settlements, aka the BIS, was officially founded as an international institution owned by central banks via an intergovernmental agreement between Germany, Belgium, France, the UK, the United States, Switzerland, Italy, and Japan. This was originally conceived as a way to handle reparations payments from World War I owed by Germany, as outlined in the Young Plan of 1929. However, that was abolished by 1932. The BIS's existence is known mostly in whispers, and its true power was regarded with dread by close observers. Basically, this is the central bank of the central banks, so it's meta. If you're a parent and you'd like to explain what the Bank of International Settlements is to your small children, the easiest thing to do is just show them that clip from Harry Potter where they go to the Gringotts Wizarding Bank, because it's like an underground place that's, you know, complete with 800-year-old gnome-looking dudes, and the only way to escape is on a fire-breathing dragon. Okay? <laughs> According to the official site federalreservehistory.org, few people took notice of Bertie Forbes' expose on Jekyll Island, and many were dismissive of its veracity. However, the participants themselves, long denying the secretive events in the formation of the Federal Reserve, would go on to give accounts of their actions at Jekyll Island, 
apparently after Senator Carter Glass took credit for the lion's share of the formation of the central banking system in his own 1927 memoir, An Adventure in Constructive Finance, and in public debates of the time period. Supposedly critical of Glass's version, both Paul Warburg and Senator Aldrich made their attempts to set the record straight, bringing the dark intrigues into the light just as the country was plunging into depression. Warburg's 1930 two-volume book set on the Federal Reserve System, Its Origin and Growth, directly addressed Senator Glass's claims and alluded to the secrecy that prevailed. In November 1910, I was invited to join a small group of men who, at Senator Aldrich's request, were to take part in a several days conference with him to discuss the form that the new banking bill should take. When the conference closed, the rough draft of what later became the Aldrich bill had been agreed upon. The results of the conference were entirely confidential. Even the fact that there had been a meeting was not permitted to become public. Though 18 years have gone by, I do not feel free to give a description of this most interesting conference concerning which Senator Aldrich pledged all participants to secrecy. I understand, however, a history of Senator Aldrich's life will contain an authorized account of this episode. Ironically, then, their nearly two decades long legacy of secrets at Jekyll Island was exposed during a grown up man tantrum over who would get the credit. <laughs> January and April 1931 each respectively saw banking panics. Boondoggles, because I really wanted to use the word boondoggles in the 1930s, and subsequent hoarding, inflationary pressure on Federal Reserve notes, and widespread banking failures. Individual states declared bank holidays to slow the panics as needed with increasing frequency. I mean, it was starting to unravel, basically. Meanwhile, the 1931 German debt crisis further dragged on the international monetary system and the economic catastrophe made way for Hitler's rise to power. Because the first go around didn't suck bad enough. On September 21st, 1931, Britain suspended the gold standard, while gold reserves at the Bank of England swelled tenfold over the next decade. In October 1931, the Federal Reserve responded to bank failures by raising the discount rate, in turn further spiking interest rates and triggering alarm on top of panic. So you got panic, then you've also got alarm. But raising the discount rate had other less fortunate consequences. For the economy as a whole, the result was disastrous. High interest rates discouraged borrowing and choked off the flow of money to business. More businesses failed, more jobs were lost, and more banks collapsed. The country was pushed deeper into the Great Depression. Hyperventilation and mattress stuffing became the new iconic national pastime. Between 1932 and 1938, Bank of England acquired enough gold to replenish the drain of funds from London under the Exchequer's resources. On January 13, 1932, Representative McFadden, who spent a full decade as the chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Currency from 1920 to 1931, introduced a resolution indicting the Federal Reserve Board for criminal conspiracy, stating in part... In 1928, the member banks of the Federal Reserve System borrowed $60,598,690,000 from the Federal Reserve Banks. Think of it, $60 billion payable upon demand in gold in the course of one single year. Six times as much monetary gold as there is in the entire world. Is it any wonder that there is a depression in this country? On June 10, 1932, 100 years after Jackson's war on the bank, Rep. McFadden attacked the Federal Reserve as, quote, one of the most corrupt institutions the world has known. Just period. And fingered them as the cause of the Great Depression. And by the way, the New York Fed had just announced that it somehow magically lost 385 million in French gold prompting France to withdraw the remainder of the gold and send somebody over there to ask if they looked in the Fed's couch cushions. <laughs> 
these 12 private credit monopolies were deceitfully and disloyally foisted upon this country by the bankers who came here from Europe and repaid us for our hospitality by undermining our American institutions. Those bankers took money out of this country to finance Japan in a war against Russia. They drove a wedge between the Allies and the World War. They fomented and instigated the Russian Revolution, and they placed a large fund of American dollars at Trotsky's disposal in one of their branch banks in Sweden. They have since begun the breaking up of American homes and the dispersal of American children. Through the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, the riffraff of every country is operating on the public credit of this United States government. Meanwhile, and on account of it, we ourselves are in the midst of the greatest depression we've ever known. November 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president and given a mandate to implement his New Deal, conceptualized earlier that summer at the DNC convention. The following month, on December 13th, McFadden motioned to impeach President Hoover, but the motion failed. On January 30th, 1933, exactly 284 years to the day after Charles I was beheaded in England, Hitler was elected chancellor in Germany. Then a bunch of things happened really quickly, back to back. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. On March 4th, 1933, FDR's inauguration speech declared his intent to seize, quote, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency. We require two safeguards against a return of the evils of the old order. There must be a strict supervision of all banking and credit and investment. There must be an end to speculation with other people's money. And there must be provision for an adequate but sound currency. I am prepared, under my constitutional duty, to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. This would be the rather dangerous one ring to rule them all power that is extremely hard to resist or destroy. Two days later, on March 6th, FDR declared the start of a four-day bank holiday nationwide to stave off bank runs and total collapse of the American banking system. All Federal Reserve transactions were suspended. After more than 9,000 banks had failed during the previous three years, the U.S. government had effectively gone bankrupt. Three days later, on March 9th, the Emergency Banking Act was rushed through, authorizing the Federal Reserve Banks to issue additional currency in order to reopen banks with deposit insurance guaranteed by the government. In effect, Americans then redeposited most of the currency that had been previously withdrawn in a fevered rush, restoring confidence. The following day, FDR issued Executive Order 6073, reopening banks and the Federal Reserve System, but preventing payment in gold. A week later, on March 17th, Hitler's new director of the Reich Bank took over, cutting deals with the Bank of England, who agreed to supply a steady stream of gold to the regime. According to economic historian Albrecht Richel, with the UK heavily exposed to the German debt crisis in 1931, such transfers were part of an economic appeasement plan on the part of Britain vis-a-vis -vis Nazi Germany. In turn, British assets were unfrozen, and the Nazis, quote, had a reliable partner follow the yellow brick road. On April 5, 1933, FDR issued Executive Order 6102, the so-called Gold Hoarder Law, 
requiring everyone to turn in their gold coins, gold bullion, and gold certificates to the Federal Reserve to be exchanged for other currency, or else they would face a $10,000 fine and or possible imprisonment. And I'm going to go ahead and take a shot in the dark that this is why two days later on April 7th, the production of beer in the United States officially became legal again. At that point, people were probably going to need a drink. Gold, 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 as good as gold. The reason people hold gold is as a protection against what we call tail risk, really, really bad outcomes. And to the extent that the last few years have made people more worried about potential of a major crisis, then they have gold as a protection. Do you, th- do you think gold is money? No. It's not money. It's Even a, it's if it has been money for 6,000 years, somebody reversed that and eliminated that economic law. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's an asset. I mean, it's the same, would you say treasury bills are money? I don't think they're well, money either, do, but they're a financial do, why asset. Why do central banks hold it? Well, it's, it's a form of reserves. Well, it's tradition. Long-term <laughs> tradition. Gold, gold, gold. Some gold, gold still feels better with gold. On April 20th, EO6111 prohibited earmarked gold for foreign accounts as well as exports, except by the Treasury to foreign central banks and the Bank of International Settlements. People began to take notice. Like, really? You taking the gold? What's up? Broad executive power to fight the emergency. Very, very good. Have you anything else to say? On May 4th, 1933, Rep. Louis T. McFadden charged President Roosevelt with violation of the Constitution over his handling of emergency banking maneuvers charging that FDR confiscated the property of the people and repudiated the public debt, while also claiming international bankers have combined to set up a dictatorship over the U.S. with their own ends. On May 18th, Rep. McFadden published an op-ed in the papers, charging that over $30 billion, that's a 1933 currency, mind you, had been injected into Germany via the Federal Reserve System, beyond the already sizable amount secured by U.S. bonds to bolster the German economy under the Dawes and Young plans. This was an amount so large the Fed board dare not divulge the total, he alleged. Now prescient in hindsight, in 1933, McFadden asked, Do you know that Germany is well-armed and that we paid for her rifles and uniforms, her commercial trucks, which can be converted for military uses? and she now leads the world in aviation? McFadden also mentioned $150 million that the Fed loaned to Soviet Russia, and even bigger loans that can't be repaid to the Soviets via the Reich Bank. And that was our money, too. I say that the Federal Reserve Banks have purchased and rediscounted false, worthless, fictitious, and uncollectible acceptances drawn in Germany. Those false papers are in the vaults of the Federal Reserve Banks as security for money taken from citizens of this country by taxation, now dead losses. And then five days later, on May 23, 1933, in a hero move that has never been properly acknowledged in this country, Reb McFadden brought impeachment charges against 24 financial officials, including the Treasury Secretary and the entire Federal Reserve Board, alleging under 32 separate charges, no less, that these individuals were guilty of having robbed the U.S. government and the people by their theft and sale of gold reserves in the U.S. These individuals are guilty of having robbed the U.S. government and the people by their theft and sale of gold reserves of the U.S. Mr. Speaker, I raise to a question of constitutional privilege. On my own responsibility, I impeach Eugene Meyer, Roy Young, Edmund Platt, Eugene Black, Adolph Casper Miller, Charles Hamlin, George James, Andrew W. Mellon, Ogden Mills, William Wooden, John Pohl, J.F.T. O'Connor, members of the Federal Reserve Board, jointly and severally with high crimes and misdemeanors. Whereas I charge the aforesaid jointly and severally 
with having unlawfully issued Federal Reserve currency on false, worthless, and fictitious acceptance and other circulating evidences of debt, and with having made unlawful advancements of Federal Reserve currency. I charge them with having unlawfully taken over $80 billion from the United States government in the year 1928, and I charge them with similar thefts committed in 1929, 1930, 1931, 1932, and 1933. I charge them jointly and severally with swindling the United States Treasury and the people of the United States. I charge them jointly and severally with the crime of having treasonably conspired to destroy constitutional government in the United States. Magically, the Justice Department never pursued the matter further, and no one was ever prosecuted. However, Rep. McFadden was mocked in the papers as the man with a five-year plan to impeach everyone in Washington, D.C., his opponents defeated his re-election, effectively ending his career, and then he died shortly afterwards of a heart attack at age 60. On June 16, 1933, the Banking Act of 1933, now better known as the Glass-Steagall Act, was passed, supplementing the earlier 1932 Glass-Steagall Act. This mandated the separation of commercial and investment banking, while restricting commercial Federal Reserve member banks from dealing in non-governmental securities, investing in non-investment grade securities, or underwriting non-governmental securities, or affiliating with companies in said practices. Then, on January 30th, 1934, a day that should now be pretty familiar to everyone watching this, that would be 285 years to the day that Charles I was beheaded, FDR signed the Gold Reserve Act using his broad executive power to controversially force gold holdings, including physical gold and gold certificates, to be surrendered to the Treasury under the executive branch, further suspending the redemption of all dollars for gold indefinitely. Individuals who did not initially turn in their gold were shamed in the media and threatened with confiscation. So the government was threatening to confiscate people's gold, y'all. The Federal Reserve System, whose primary gold holdings were at the New York Fed branch, also had to surrender all of their gold to the Treasury, which was the real target of FDR's unprecedented action. A provision in this 1934 Gold Reserve Act also established an exchange stabilization fund within the Treasury allowing it to undertake open market operations, buy and sell securities, exchange foreign currencies, and tightly control gold exports, all specifically without the assistance or approval of the Federal Reserve. Meanwhile, the act also gave FDR unilateral power to proclaim the value of gold, to literally name his price, which he set at $35 a troy ounce, adjusting it from the then current market price of about $20.67 an ounce thus purposefully devaluing the dollar, and, in tandem, increasing the money supply and growth rate of the gross national product, all in an attempt to combat the Great Depression's, well, depressing effects. U.S. gold reserves more than tripled during the decade as foreign investors increasingly parked their gold with the Treasury and the New York Federal Reserve was forced to open its vaults. In short, it's effectively as if FDR and his cabinet officials studied the playbook of the Federal Reserve and Bank of England actions during World War I and then nationalized them in time for the expensive and all-consuming endeavor of World War II. These powers remained with the executive branch of the federal government until 1951. Just after the Gold Act was implemented, FDR wrote to the governor of the Federal Reserve Board, Eugene Black, in order to assert his non-interference with the Federal Reserve's, quote, mission. In response, Eugene Meyer, the Fed governor until 1933 and publisher of the Washington Post at the time, quipped that Roosevelt's letter was more like a eulogy for the bank, writing, The plain and unvarnished fact is, 
that the Federal Reserve System of today is not the one established 20 years ago, any more than it is the system which existed a year back. The present organization has been shorn of its power to formulate an independent credit policy, and it can no longer regulate the flow of funds into and out of this country, as it did when the United States was on the gold standard. The Gold Reserve Act of 1934 not only took from the system all of its gold, but in doing so, definitely deprived it of future control over gold movements. With the passage of this act, therefore, the central banking system of this country formally surrendered one of the chief privileges and duties which it had exercised prior to suspension of gold payments. The administration has assumed responsibility for defining our monetary policies. You constitutional scholars and literate Americans out there watching this T-Rex versus Velociraptor fight may recall that for what it's worth, and hopefully that's still something, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 of the U.S. Constitution grants power over money to Congress, not the president or executive branch, and definitely not to a private bank. Turn in your gold, brother. Turn it in. Keeping what's good is now a sin. Hold your bonds and keep your stocks. All them things, what's on the rocks? Cut your coupons, don't be lax. Uncle Sam wants income tax. Soon, if he don't get relief, he'll want the gold that's in your teeth. Never mind, just wear a smile. We're on the last long weary mile. If Roosevelt hasn't got the dope, what the hell? There is no hope. At any rate, on November 21st, 1934, it was reported that Major General Smedley Butler testified that he was approached circa 1933 to lead the so-called business plot, a would-be fascist coup to overthrow FDR to allegedly install a dictator a little more friendly to Wall Street and likely the Federal Reserve as well. I appeared before the Congressional Committee the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. After blowing the whistle, Butler was hailed as a hero, cheered in the streets during a ticker tape parade past the Capitol. Just kidding. Actually, Major General Smedley Butler was literally laughed at and ridiculed by the press, who declared the plot to be a total hoax and the best laugh of this year, as his entire testimony was publicly undermined and the serious implications completely ignored. That is, until a subsequent investigation by the House Committee on Un-American Activities found that what Butler described was, quote, alarmingly true. The plot had actually been discussed, but once again, no one was prosecuted. <laughs> the Federal Suppository Insurance Corporation, FDIC. In 1935, FDR signed the Banking Act of 1935, which made the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, permanent the premiums for this insurance are paid for by the banks. And included some 46 sections of technical amendments that clarified banking legislation. The act faced harsh criticism from Carter Glass over who was to have the most control, bankers or politicians. I'm not really sure, but I wonder if FDR's face when he signed the act is any indication. What do you guys think? In 1936, Fort Knox, a prison for gold, was built by the Treasury to serve as a bullion deposit under the new Gold Act powers, and additionally to hold numerous priceless historical documents, including the original Constitution and Declaration of Independence, so that no one could steal them. Not even Nick Cage. The first gold deposits were allegedly moved starting in 1937, two years before the outbreak of war in Europe and were declared completed sometime in 1941, conveniently just ahead of the U.S. entry into World War II. Three million five hundred thousand dollar home of the Federal Reserve, founded in the Wilson administration, is opened in Washington. The 
board, now headed by Mariner S. Eccles, is present as the building is dedicated by President Roosevelt. I dedicate this building today to progress, to progress toward the ideal of an America in which every worker will be able to provide his family at all times with an ever-rising standard of American comfort. Spon the money, never done. Spon the money, ha ha. Spon the money, gon' never done. Spon the money, oh, spon the money, gon' never done. Spon the grade your potato, ah, grade your potato. Put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gon' make it yellow. Love, girl, love, love, girl, love. Love, girl, love, girl, spun your money. Ah, spun your money, never done. Spun. Oh, mama, go spun your money, go never done. Aye, I know you like it. Oh, money, go never done. Spun your money. I went down to town the other day, spun your money. I see all them boys getting bouncy, not spun your money. What I call my money, get five dollars, go on the trip, not spun your money. Oh, mama, gonna mama, 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 gonna spawn your money. Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, love, girl, love, girl, spawn your money. Oh, spawn your money, gonna never done. Oh, you're going to narrow. You're going to narrow. Oh, you put one half a yard in it, gonna make it wider. Oh, spawn your money, gonna never done. Spawn the money. Oh, mama, 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 go spawn your money, go. 